Hello, everyone. Welcome to this wonderful conversation between me and Feruza Dumas. Am I pronouncing your last name right? Well, if you took French 101, you'd know it's Dumas, but that's okay. Oh, oh sorry. So sorry. <laughs> Um, and uh, we're going to be talking to each other today about our books and how they're going to be used in the classroom and how they could be used in the classroom. Um, and just to introduce myself, my name is Malika Garib. I'm the author of I Was There American Dream, a graphic memoir about being Filipino Egyptian American. Um, and I'm going to let Firuza interview, uh, 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 introduce herself. I'm Firuza Juma, and I'm probably best known for Funny and Farsi, which uh, is a book that is, thank you, <laughs> which. Um, I guess I'm the first Iranian American humorist. Uh, what is it, 18 years ago, I wrote this book, 20 years ago I wrote this book. And I just so honored to be here today because I love talking about these kind of stories. And I loved, loved, loved this book. So lots to say today. Loved your book too. Oh my gosh, I cried at the end with your dad. I'm not gonna give any way any spoilers, but I I'm, I'm in love with this book. And I, I think um, most of the questions that I'm gonna ask you today in our very short 20 minute conversation is about how you wrote it in 2003, but it is so, so relevant to today, to what's happening today about um, celebrating uh, immigrant families and why we still have to sort of, um, have to sort of def defend um, you know, immigrant lives in this country. Um, so, I mean, I'm happy to go first with questions or if you wanna go first, just let me know. Uh, I mean, would you like me to answer that question first? Yeah, I'd love to ask uh, that question. If you wanna answer it, go for it. You know, when I, I came to America in 1972 and we were actually the only Iranian family in our town. So my experience was, I, I was it. And I, I never saw myself in a book. I never saw myself in a movie. So, you know, I wrote this book back when, just, just to let you know how different it was, I kept getting rejected by, by agents because they, they kept telling me like, there's no readers out there for Middle Eastern stories that are funny. I mean, is there even an audience for that? So um, the conversation is still the same. I mean, we're still having it. And, but, the, but the great thing is like, now there's so many more voices in there. That, that's a really beautiful thing. I mean, I, as much as, it was exciting being sort of the first out there. I never wanted to be the only one. I always wanted to be a part of a bigger movement. And so this is a really exciting time for me. Yeah, I mean, we're living in the age of TV shows like Rami, which is, you know, a comedy about an Egyptian fam man, his family in the United States. So, I mean, that's like, is that on like Hulu? I don't, yeah. By the way, I love that show. Um, you know, Funny and Farsi was made into a pilot by ABC and it was like the first ethnic family show to be made. It was not picked up because it was just way too early. Um, way too early. Way too early. So uh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that now there's there's so much to choose from. But, you know, it's such an important conversation that, you know, and I love one thing I loved about your book is that, by the way, if this book had been around when I had in school, my life would have been a lot easier. But <laughs> I said the same thing I, about your book. What, what I loved about this though, was that you talked about microaggressions and what it means. And you, you present it in such a palatable way. And I was wondering, this was my question to you. Do you think that the conversations that we are having about microaggressions are actually making a difference? Or do you think we're just sort of, it's like an echo chamber? You know, it's a really good question. I, I consider myself um, baby, I considered myself baby woke when I was writing that book and, and around the time of 2019. And I was just learning about the terms like decolonization, colonization, the history of the Philippines. Oh my gosh, we've been colonized for 400, 500 years by the Spaniards. Um, you know, learning about, you know, during 9-11, um, I, I was a little bit too young to sort of feel the effects of, of you know, like of, of racism, you know, among my peers, but certainly after 2016, I started to see this, um, this rhetoric in, in the news and the media and politics, uh, this anti-Muslim rhetoric. And I felt like um, I started to just learn about, I wanted to learn about like, where is all this like weird anti-immigrant stuff coming from? And like, how do I feel about all this stuff? And as I dug deeper into my journey of understanding my identity and my roots and, um, you know, colonization, things like that, that's when I encountered the word microaggressions. I was 29, 30 years old. I had never heard of that word, never used it before in my life. And even when I read the word, I was like, I'm sure that none of these 
I would never have experienced a microaggression in my life. I'm sure of it. But I sat myself down and I said, let me challenge myself to write at least five things that I might consider to be a microaggression. And a microaggression is, you know, just like a little, little side comment. Actually, I don't know what the technical term is, but I, but what is the technical, do you know what the technical term is? I can no. Google it. But basically it's like these little side comments about the, about my race that, that might, you know, be a little, dis be disparaging. And, you know, I said, oh, I remember when people used to say, can you walk like an Egyptian? Um, you know, uh, can you speak Egyptian? Uh, and I was like, we speak Arabic. And the list became 10 and then 20 and then 50. I had 50 thing, microaggressions that I could think of in just that exercise. And I was like, oh my goodness, I feel like um, little light bulbs are going off in my brain. Like I feel like I'm freeing myself and learning about myself. And um, I think that while that word feels like it's been spread around and it can feel like it's, it's like, oh, we're talking about microaggressions again. Honestly, it's it's a new term for lots of different people, and it certainly was for me. That I know that term's been around, so um, it was like a new discovery. I never um, feel uh, like, oh no, here we go again, talking about um, you know uh, obsession with whiteness um, in the immigrant community, because for some people that may be their their gateway to thinking a little bit more critically about themselves. Because I certainly didn't. Right. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned 9-11. Um, 9-11 was impetus for Funny and Farsi actually being published. Wow. I, I actually started writing the book for my children because I realized that my children had never heard my story. Like I said, I never existed in any books or movies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember my son, um, who was a very avid reader, came home from school one day and he said to me, do books have to be depressing to be on school reading lists? And, you know, I realized that, that everything about the Middle East that ever was on TV or in a book or a magazine, it was depressing. And that we were, I felt like Middle Easterners were always portrayed as being so oppressed and sad. And, and I thought, you know what, there's joy, there's a lot of joy in my life. There's a lot of joy in my culture. And I love the fact that, that people used to say to me, and you know what, when I think about it now, maybe this is a microaggression. I didn't, I didn't, there was no label at the time, but I remember people always would say to me, I can't believe I read a book by an Iranian woman and I laughed out loud. Oh, wow. And again, like sort of points to the fact that the stereotype we have is that we're always weeping. Right. And you know, it, it's, that, it, that is a huge stereotype because and like whenever I visit a school, I always sing happy birthday in Persian and kids would come up to me and say, I never really thought that kids in the Middle East are celebrating birthdays and that there's a song. <laughs> So that, oh that is a whopper of a dark cloud that's always been, you know, over like the whole Middle East as, you know, as far as the West is concerned, like we are sad, sad people. So, um, I mean, I just like, I, I can't tell you how happy I am that there's all these voices out there that, 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 and you know, joy is as much of a teacher as sadness is. And it used to be that the whole text, the whole thing about immig immigration was always about the sadness. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's really important to show that it's also a joy to be an immigrant. Oh, like, yeah. we, we love being an immigrant in this country. And, you know, our, um, we love this country. I, th I think this is some, some things that, that, I mean, it's very obvious in your, in your book, that, you know, how much your life changed. And this, which brings me to, to your, to the question I want to ask you, which is you talk about sort of the guilt in terms of, you know, as immigrants, you know, our parents did everything for us. Therefore, we have to give back to them in a certain way, like being a doctor or a lawyer, living nearby, you know? And you talk about this, this sort of guilt at breaking out and following your own dreams. And I'm just wondering, you know, what do you say to other kids who are in that position right now? Oh gosh, I wish I had a great answer um, because I know that the, I know that the, it's not guilt, you know, it is guilt, but more it's a sensitivity and awareness of the hardship that our parents have faced and our own motivation to do them right. And we have to find a different way to do that that isn't going to hurt us too. So I don't want to spend my whole life being a doctor and as a, as a way to make money and give back to my family if that's not the, the way that I, if that's not what I'm passionate about. Think about the root, the root impetus of what you're trying to, to achieve for your parents, because you'll always love, you know, coming from an immigrant family, your parents are at the top, you know, like you love and respect them so much. And 
So try to find a way that can make both them happy and you happy. Um, and there are, are lots of different ways, like writing a book about them later <laughs> in life. <laughs> My parents are so proud. So yeah. Um, yeah, well, I would love to throw that question back to you actually. Well, you know, boy, that's a, um, that, that's a tough one for me because I always, you know, I, I feel guilty that I don't, I don't live near my parents. Wow. But at the same time, what can I, what can I do? You know, this is where my husband and I moved here for jobs. So, so I actually, you know what? I live with perpetual guilt. Let me just put it out there. <laughs> I, it's just part of my daily life. Yeah. It, um, guilt it is, is part it, of it. But on the other hand, like I tell my children, I'm like, I want you guys to be happy. So you do, you, you do what makes you happy. And the cycle ends with you, which is the cycle good. ends with me. Yes. Yeah. Um, so of course now my kids don't live near me. So I don't know. Maybe I should have like put some guilt in them. <laughs> I take it back. Come back. Um, I had a question for you. I was very interested in hearing. We, we had a chance to talk to each other, um, you know, uh, last week. Uh, get to know each other a little bit. And I found it very interesting that you said that you didn't consider this book to be a race and identity book. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit more about that because I was like, how? This is about an immigrant family and your experience in the United States. And you're, you know, you're by the way of showing what's happening in your family life, you're bucking the stereotypes left and right. So. Well, I love, see, this is what I love about talking to people who are of a different generation because I think we're saying the same thing, but using different words. Oh yeah. So when I wrote Funny and Farsi, my whole platform was shared humanity. I never once thought about race or identity. I was really talking about just shared humanity because I, I've always believed that everybody has a story to tell, everybody's story counts. And the more we hear first person stories, the more we realize how similar we are. Like our commonalities far outweigh our differences. And I've always said this, like, if you look, you know, in the pantry I grew up with, all we had was lentils, rice, you know, like dried limes. And you look in my friend Carolyn's pantry, she had like chips, Oreos, like, those were the differences in our lives. But when you looked at like the fundamentals of the human experience, they're all the same. You know, mothers have the same worry and burdens on them. We all have a weird uncle. So it was really, to me, the words were shared humanity. Nowadays, when I work with teachers, yes, I love that new words are coming up like race and identity. And I'm like, yes, sign me up. Um, <laughs> and you know what? I bet you 20 years from now, other writers will be having the same conversation using different words. Yeah, that's, that's, I want to like go back to this idea of like same conversation. Cause like when I read your book, I was like, you know, this book, like the book that I wrote could have been written like, you know, at any, at any time after like the, the, the wave of immigrants um, who came to the US. I mean, like, it seems like we're going through the same thing, just saying it a different way. Exactly. My question is like, why are we still having the same problems? You, you're one generation, um, you know, ahead of me. Like, why was my experience similar to yours in America? Like, I thought that things should be changing year after year. See, so here's the thing. I, of course, am a natural optimist. And I think that change begins in schools. So the fact that now teachers are on board and saying, hey, let's, let's read books that are written by different voices. Growing up, I thought that to be a writer, you had to be English and dead. Okay, I, I never, people would say, people said to me, when did you know you want to be a writer? When I was like almost 40, because I didn't think it was ever an option in my life. So the fact that like educators now are having conversations in the classroom, and even if they're just saying, hey, read this book, that's a lot. Even if somebody reads this book and never talks about it, a seed has been planted. You can never go back to being as closed-minded once you read a book like this. And, and, and I got to say, I loved your book because I feel like it's for boys and it's for girls. You know, it's not like written for any, um, you know, specific and all, oh, by the way, all age group. I think junior high, high school, college. I loved it. So mm -hmm. thank you. And um, Malika, how do you want teachers to use this book, though, in the classroom? Well, you know, I would love for them to, to have the students read it, but also, um, I think what's great, as and they've seen some schools do, I, I've been doing some events, is having students share their own personal stories. It, like, if I could tell my story, so can you. 
Um, and everyone has a story, whether you're white or a person of color or, or you know any ethnicity. Everybody has grown up with a set of values. They, their parents had dreams for themselves. Their parents had dreams for you. How do your dreams differ from your parents' dreams? What are some of the values and traditions that you grew up with in your, in your family? How do you plan to carry that forward in your life? Or how, what are the ones that you don't wanna take with you? And once students start answering those questions, they're like, oh my gosh, I have a story about my family and my upbringing and my heritage and my, my culture, uh, um, no matter what ethnicity you are, to share. And I think that's a really powerful thing. No, I love that. And I, I love that. And you know, it's interesting because um, I've been fortunate because teachers started using Funny and Farsi 18 years ago when it was published. So it's been used and it's used all the time in like common reads, summer reads, which I think, by the way, this is a great book for that. Um, but, but what I find is interesting is when I visit a school, which I do outside when there's no pandemic, is I cannot leave a school because the kids want to tell me a story. Oh, what do they want to tell and, you? Oh, you name it. I mean, Oh God, I've heard, I, and I love them. I cannot tell you how touched I am oh. uh, by the fact that kids, and, and, and I have teachers tell me, they say, you know, like that kid who was talking to you, he's never talked in, in class before. Oh, like, you know, like funny and farcy is really accessible. Like you read, you read the book and you go, any idiot could have written this. It's not, you know, it's not James Joyce. It's not Russian literature where you need like cliff notes. Funny and farcy is the kind of stories that everybody has. It's just life stories. Which, and I, and I wonder too, if when kids read this, I wonder if a lot of kids are gonna make their own graphic novels, you know, cause I, I, I love so. the drawings. I mean, I know we've been talking about um, the message in the book, but I love the fact your drawings are hilarious. They're Thank you. I actually am inspired from my diaries of my youth. This is from <laughs> my, from 1999. And I often drew and wrote in my diaries at the same time. So, uh, oh, here's another one. You clearly did not have older brothers because I never felt safe enough to keep a diary. Uh, <laughs> it would be, it would have been read. So <laughs> no, I would have beat up anyone. So yeah. Um, and and how else is your your um how else would you like to see your book being used in the classroom? Well, you know, um, the thing I love about teachers is that they talk to one another, and I have, you know, I I think whatever teachers do is great, but it's interesting like how creative teachers are. So I I am just. Any anytime a teacher assigns this book, I'm happy because I know it leads to something else. And oftentimes kids do all kinds of projects as, as a result of it, um, whether it's writing their own stories or even, you know, I have a free study guide on my website, um, which is fearsajuma.com. So there's ideas there. But I just think anytime a kid reads a story about someone who's on the evening news and that gives and that, and that book gives them a different perspective because you know when you think about iran on the evening news it's always some bearded guy saying something really scary that that's 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 the image so anything that changes that image is is a huge positive so i think listen just reading the book and the other thing i gotta say is i love this trend of summer reading of assigning books that are actually kind of fun to read because they're educational and fun and i can see this book by the way you know, at the beach. <laughs> this really is the perfect summer read, I gotta oh, say. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you, thank you. I think we've got one minute left in our conversation. Is there anything else that- Yeah, I, listen, I just wanna thank educators because this book, Funny and Farsi, has been 100% word of mouth. And it's all been because of teachers and librarians. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I just wanna say, this book is next. <laughs> oh, thank you, Oh. Well, um, it was lovely talking to you and I'm Likewise. really happy to um, Penguin for putting us together because I would have never um, gotten the opportunity to meet you, so. I know, and now we have to get together and have and share a meal because you have this great mung bean recipe in here. Oh no. Oh. My favorite bean, so <laughs> destiny. That's great, oh, love it.